This episode is brought to you by Tegas, the future of investment research. If you follow my newsletters, you know that Tegas is one of the things I use most often. Almost every post I have has a some clip from an expert call or some quote from a management transcript that I've got off BM SEC that, you know, it's because of Tegas that I've got access to all of that. It's revolutionized how I get up to speed on new industries and companies. I've been a happy subscriber of it for over three years now. And I, I tell you, I use probably every day I'm logging on to Tegas to look at an expert call transcript. And I certainly know, I mean, my BAM SEC, I am glad that it's unlimited because I am looking at BAM SEC all the time. I, I'm looking at my Google Chrome right now and I have 30 tabs open and I'd say 18 of them are from BAM SEC. So between Tegas and BAM SEC, I am a very devoted user here. Uh, look, it's one platform where you can dive into expert call transcripts, management checks, panel calls, and detailed financial data. No more fragmented data sources or endless searching. Tegas brings everything together, giving you a crystal clear view of the industries and companies that matter most. If you're ready to supercharge your research, visit tegas.com slash value. That's T-E-G-U-S dot com slash value. Trust me, once you've experienced Tegas, you won't go back to your old way of doing research. All right. Hello and welcome to the Yet Another Value podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Walker. If you like this podcast, it would mean a lot if you could rate, subscribe, review wherever you're watching or listening to it. With me today, I'm happy to have on for the second time, the godfather of coal, Matt Warner. Matt, how's it going? It's going great, Andrew. Thanks for having me on again. And, you know, love love talking about coal at all points in times. Uh, you know, it's been, been a pretty rough few months for Matt, but uh, there, there's a lot of interesting things that are starting to permeate on the thermal side. Uh, which, you know, have once again kind of pushed uh, pushed some of these companies into the headlines. So love to get into it with you and, and go down that rabbit. Well, I, I've been excited since we decided a few weeks ago to to do this. Let, let's get there in a second. But before we get started, just want to remind everyone, quick disclaimer, nothing on this podcast is investing in advice. That's always true, maybe particularly true today because Matt and I are going to bounce through the entire coal space. So, you know, there's like, there's not like a thousand companies there, but there's five to 10. And I'll add in a disclaimer, I have a small position in Peabody. The ticker there is BTU. I'm long that. So I, I, I know for sure that's going to come at some point. So there's your disclaimer. Please consult a financial advisor, uh, do your own work, all that type of stuff. Matt, there's so much I want to talk to you about that's going on in the coal space. I'm pulling up my notes over here. Uh, sure. I, I want to talk about a bunch of different things, but I guess the place to start, you and I are recording this September 18th. We're recording this as the Fed is coming out with the 50 basis point. I, but I, I just want to start by asking, as you and I sit here, September 18th, where do you think we are in you know just the overall coal market? What are How are you thinking about coal today? All right. Well, I mean, you know, when, when last I was on your pod, we talked about, you know, the uh, the long-term thesis is there's not enough high-quality material to to provide to either uh, the power industry or the steel industry, um, and largely that thesis remains unchanged. Uh, you know, short-term can do a lot to sentiment, uh, but uh, you know, short-term also has uh, you know very little effect on what's going to happen ten years from now. Uh, so, so yeah, with with regard to the long-term thesis, that's still intact. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, kind of a, a reversal of what I sort of suspected fortunes would be for the for this year, in that thermal coal has actually done really well over the summer. Prices have been very resilient. Uh, you know, companies that have been selling, uh, Consol in particular, who just went through a merger, is going through a merger with Arch, had a, had a really fantastic second quarter set up for a strong back half of the year. Meanwhile, Met, uh, Met buyers have not exited shoulder season yet. So they stopped buying in February, March, and the prices just marched steadily, steadily downward, uh, down below, uh, you know, down below 200. And now all of a sudden, producers are finding, you know, flexibility in their costs, and uh, rail providers in the U.S. Are, are being more responsive. So, so now there's there's a bit of a reshuffle around around that space uh, as we as we head into uh, what is normally shoulder season for thermal coal. We should see power demand uh, begin to to fall off here in the next few months. We should see thermal coal prices begin to come down. That's uh, that's sort of what we're seeing right now, uh, but uh, you know, again, just the, the long term demand picture for both uh, keeps keeps picking up really strangely, and especially so uh, as we just mentioned on the thermal coal side. So I think the the reason you and I talked and started getting ready for this podcast is we wanted to talk about uh, coal for AI, and I think there are two ways we can talk about that. You know, you could talk about literally building coal, clean coal, uh, carbon zero coal plants and using those to power AI plants. That's one. We'll get there in a second. But as we're talking just about the overall coal market, I, I want to ask, you said 
thermal coal prices have surprised. The demand has surprised. We haven't really hit a shoulder. And I want to ask, you know, the last time we talked was kind of before the big AI boom. Obviously, NVIDIA stock price always goes up, but it was before you really started seeing all the AI goes, guys go, oh, power is what we need. That's where the shortage on the AI. It was, I think it was right when the Amazon deal with Talon right outside that nuke was announced. And then you saw a string of deals where just all these AI guys are saying, we are desperate for power. So I just want to ask, as we sit here mid-September, you know, we'll take coal powering AI plants later, but just, is that demand for power, is that starting to impact like the short term, throw more coal, you know, even if AI today doesn't want it, if they're taking all the nuke power, somebody's got to power everything else. Is that really starting to play out for coal at all? Uh, yes, and those is a, is a short answer. Yes, uh, we've already sort of kicked the can down the road with regard to, I think, plant retirements. So, uh, you know, Homer City, you know, and PJM had come off uh, last year. I think that's, I think that's probably the last one we're going to see for a little bit, just because the, the, the necessary reality of increase, increasing power demand is that you have to draw from your baseload, uh, you know, more heavily uh, than you did in, in years prior. And, you know, the, the entire energy crisis was built around, you know, this notion that you could swap out, you know, baseload capacity for intermittent capacity. And then, of course, we had, you know, the, you know historic uh, brownouts and blackouts in Texas in the middle of winter and all those sorts of things. And, and that started to show kind of the, the cracks in the armor. Uh, with, with regard to that argument, so to speak. So, so now I think it's a little bit more accepted, even amongst uh, you know the, the more progressive crowds I tend to talk to in, in DC, uh, that okay, well, we do need to have some sort of base load, uh, you know, capacity. We need to be able to to kick these uh, plant retirements out a little bit because the you know the the data center power demand build out is is just it's too much for our existing grid to deal with um, at the moment. So. So we have to be able to make concessions for that. There are a couple of ways to do it. You can co-locate a facility, uh, you know, next to a data center, you know, be that solar and wind, you can offset a little bit of it, uh, but you got to kind of do it at the corporate development. Uh, and so, so now that's escalated up to, well, let's, let's maybe consider, you know, grid level plants uh, to do some kind of behind the meter agreement with, with these data centers. And, you know, to date, they've been talking about, you know, I mean, they mostly put them near population centers, right? Because, uh, latency with regard to uh, with to data is is an issue, and, and also you know the states and cities themselves are going obviously going to say, sure, come build it over here and bring us jobs. Of course, they're going to say that. So they're seeing it now. But if you see some of the states that have said this, I remember Wall Street they're saying, oh my God, we don't like it. Like they run, they take up so much power. There's a constant buzzing noise. You know, you've got they're they're not pretty. It's basically a big cement block out there. Like they, I do think they're starting to reevaluate that just a little bit. But you know, competition for jobs being what it is, that people probably end up living with it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think that's kind of how it's gone. But obviously, that's had a huge impact on. Uh, localized power prices, and so it's been the ratepayers who've really been punished punished for that. Uh, for that uh, sort of, it's not necessarily an error in judgment of location. I think it's best practice, probably, you know, for for those data centers as they exist here at the moment. But uh, you know, power prices are, have gone way up, uh, and you know, to the point where this is, you know, this is going to become kind of a cottage industry. I think for you know a lot of uh, you know power plants that have been uh, you know. Hydro and some some power some power technologies have been left for dead a long time ago, uh, but you know the bottom line is if we're going to grow at this pace and you know if we think about it from a national security perspective, it, it would behoove us not to win the AI race relative to China because there's a lot of problems that we can throw AI at uh, that that AI could solve for us, you know, just for starters. Um, but if if that's going to be the case, we need to sort of create some alternative scenarios or start uh, start thinking outside of the box with regard to where that power is going to come from, uh, you know, until, you know, battery storage gets here, knock on wood in 20, 30, 40 years, who knows? Uh, when, so, you talk so, to, yeah. when you talk to coal players, especially the thermal coal players, are they saying that? Are they saying, hey, there were some plants that we thought might be getting retired, going offline, but now just because of this enormous demand, they're not only not retire, like they're coming back, they're thinking, I, I don't think I've seen any coal growth plant growth stories, but are they kind of starting to hear their buyers say, hey, it, we're going to be here in 25, we're going to be here in 26, when maybe before it was a question mark? To some extent, uh, you know, this, uh, I spoke at a conference in Myrtle Beach earlier in the summer. Uh, and 
let's just say that that is the first time in, you know, it's probably since the start of my career that I've heard the words, we might see another coal plant get built. Um, and what about Longview? Wasn't Longview a one in 2015 or so? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's right in my back of the neck of the woods, uh, you know, in Morgantown, West Virginia. And uh, yeah, that was that was one of the last uh, the last few. And of course, it's running all natural gas right now. So, oh, so is it? I, I haven't followed the story. So yeah, such as life on, on those kinds of things. But uh, you, know, but the the we're here. It, you know, is the bottom line. We're we're here at this point where baseload demand has to increase, and we have to have some uh, some difficult and maybe creative conversations about how we can quell that demand uh, going forward. And you know, one of the things that we've never really taken seriously, I think, as a culture. Uh, has been carbon capture and sequestration, which you know, at least from a from an intellectual standpoint, would be the easiest thing to do, provided you had the technology to uh, uh, to capture it. And you know, the Inflation Reduction Act put in these, uh, you know, these forty five Z, yeah, forty five Q. I think credits is 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 what 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 would apply to carbon emissions. Um, and nobody's really done much with them until here now, because we're forced into this position to. Actually, look look under all the stones to see uh, to see what's going to work. Um, and honestly, you know, carbon capture and sequestration. I think if you put it in the right place, with the right types of facilities, with the right uh, political environment, you probably can uh, get something done. And then, of course, the end of Chevron deference uh, this year means that a lot of those uh, sort of top level regulatory decisions, which would have been reserved for the federal government have now been kicked back to the states. And so we have a, you know, a kind of multilateral, uh, you know, political environment nationally for this uh, than we would have uh, otherwise. And there are some exceptions to that. I think uh, uh, the Clean Water Rule, uh, Clean Water Act is one of them. Uh, there are probably some others. I'm, I'm not, a, not a legal expert by any means, but uh, but for I, I do think it provides us a chance to, it, it opens the door to uh, some possibilities that weren't there before, which is you know, kind of why we started talking about doing this podcast. Let me just go two more things on the broad coal just sector in general, and then I want to start digging into AI. Uh, just you mentioned Matt. You know, again, we're talking in the Fed just cut uh, just cut rates by fifty basis points. Mm -hmm. I think people look at Met and everything, and they worry about the the near term demand. Right? Do you? I haven't followed the U.S. steel thing too closely, but it's been pretty clear. U.S. steel said, that, "Hey, if you don't let us sell to, if you don't let us sell, there's going to be some plant closures." China is uh, really slowing down over there. Uh, obviously, that doesn't impact when you talk about the long term. Hey, the demand's going to be there. We don't have the supply on the coal side. That doesn't impact the long term. But I think people look at the short term and they say, "Ooh, you know, if I'm looking at something that's got a lot of med exposure." The short term, the demand side might not look too good. So I'd love to get your thoughts just on the overall supply demand of MET right now. Sure. Uh, so, I mean, there's, there's no other way to say it. <laughs> China steel market stinks uh, fully and completely. Um, actually, I was actually working on a piece here this morning that talks about uh, China demand. There's one comment that came out in a Fast Markets article that, uh, you know, there will be no golden, you know, September or silver October for the steel industry in China this year, uh, just because the stockpile is really high, real estate demand is absolutely in the toilet, uh, and those dynamics are unlikely to uh, resolve here anytime soon. In addition to that, there have been trade cases, uh, you know, brought against China by Vietnam, Turkey, uh, Canada, I think, uh, and a couple of other countries that are reducing the ability to to offload, you know, this glut of steel that they have. Uh, so it's it's really echoes of you know, back when I first became a steel analyst, 2014, 2013 era, uh, you know, we went into this period where China dumped a lot of boron added steel, a lot of lower quality material into the market. You know, it took, that took about 12 to 18 months for all the trade cases to come on and, and the, the entire commodity sector absolutely collapsed. You know, it was led by oil uh, and steel had, had already sort of begun to pull out of it. It was actually steel that kind of brought everything out of that malaise back in 2016. So, so I think, you know, in terms of like that 12 to 18 month time frame, we're probably about six months in, uh, uh, you know, this is the first restocking cycle where China hasn't been particularly active uh, and the steel exports are affecting, uh, for instance, Indian demand as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, on the, on the Europe side, you know, demand in Europe still really hasn't recovered. 
So, so that's, that's pushed the Met prices down, down, down uh, to the point where I think, you know, today we're basically at $180, give or take. Uh, so on the pricing side, that's, that's where that is. Uh, from a cost perspective, we get into some interesting dynamics here. Uh, you know, the first thing is that I think what people will find is that contrary to the past, uh, U.S. costs will be a little bit more flexible than they have been, uh, if, if only because uh, the railroads themselves uh, found out sort of the hard way during COVID that you have to keep your uh, you, you have to keep your people. Uh, you can't afford to let crews go, so they want to maintain volumes out the export. And in order to do that, they'll they'll cut rates as prices come down. I mean, they're still going to make good money on those hauls, even if they're only charging you know twenty to twenty five dollars for the rail haul. You know, the port gets another five or so. Uh, so, so the U.S. can probably be competitive down to, uh, you know, 175, 160, probably pushing it uh, at, at the port. Um, but it, it just reemphasizes the importance of getting strong domestic contracts, which kind of does into your, you know, the, the U.S. steel and Nippon deal uh, as well. You know, that's, that's a deal that could increase domestic uh, steel production, increase domestic coke production out a few years, which would really be able to shore up U.S. producer balance sheets while the world sort of goes through this, uh, you know, absorbing the blood of steel coming out of China. It's a really interesting, multifaceted uh, sort of market here at the moment. This episode is brought to you by Tegas, the future of investment research. Look, if you've been reading my newsletters, you know how often I rely on Tegas for my research. I probably read one or two expert calls a day, you know, probably average seven a week off of Tegas. Uh, they've got the largest transcript library in the world with over 75% of the private market transcripts. Whether you're curious about AI, biotech, or any niche market, Tegas has the insights you need. What sets Tegas apart is its all-in-one pack platform. It's packed with expert call transcripts, management checks, panel calls, and in-depth financial data. No more jumping between different services or piecing together fragmented data. With Tegas, everything is right at your fingertips. The best part? The insights you get are from the very people shaping the industries you're interested in. You'll find perspective from insiders and executives that you can't get anywhere else. To see Tegas in action and understand why it's one of my go-to resources, visit tegas.com slash value. That's T-E-G-U-S dot com slash value. Trust me, once you try Tegas, you'll never look back. Uh, I, there's so much I want to hit on the specific pieces, but just last question you have to ask. It's September, mid-September in an election year. Election matter one way or the other for coal miners? I mean, traditionally, you'd probably say, oh, Republicans win. Good for coal miners because they've got... But, you know, like a lot of the carbon capture stuff, like it's not... The coal stocks have certainly done well under this administration uh, by and large. So yeah, yeah, exactly. just, yeah. does it really matter at this point? Good question. I don't think so, really. Uh, there, there are going to be there are going to be good things and bad things that happen, uh, regardless of, of who winds up winning. I mean, I do think that, you know, in my opinion, it's probably less good energy policy that results in positive outcomes for commodity prices and for equity prices. Yep. So, so if that's the outcome that you're probably rooting for, you know, along with along with the other peccadillos, <laughs> I want to root for the Democrats. Um, but on, on the production side, I, I just want to, it's funny when Trump gets up there and he's like, we're going to drill baby drill a energy and industry. Both I'm like yeah. energy industry. You need to vote for the Democrats. Like you want nothing to do with drilling high prices, no drilling, no supply. Let's go. And let's face it. The Democrats have been permissive with regard to drill. Like they haven't tried to do anything. Like they, they tried to outproduce everybody as a matter of fact. So like while and and with Chevron deference gone, the ability of, of Democrats to, to legislate, uh, for, or to regulate from a you know from a from an executive branch perspective is is pretty neutered. Um, so those those you know three letter agencies can't necessarily uh, create rules and enforce them in the way that they used to uh, you know sort of arbitrarily. That has to go through uh, other means now, and there there are benefits and detriments to that. You know, without getting into the into the gory details of it. Um, but you know, I, I don't think that you're going to see the same sort of regulatory capture. Uh, regulatory push from from the left that you've seen in the past just because they've kind of been uh you know they kind of been kneecapped with regard to that so uh, you know I, I think it would probably be you know more likely that democrats would have positive outcome on energy prices and energy stocks when i say positive i mean they go up yep, of course that, yep. that also that also means inflationary pressures that means other bad economic things probably means higher interest rates for a longer time 
So it's it's a mixed bag, right? Whereas you know, if the if the Republicans win, if Trump wins, the one thing that's going to transfer through to the coal fields is morale. They know they're not going to get messed with from a regulatory perspective. They'll be able to produce. Uh, you know, that, uh, being able to go to work makes people more confident in their jobs. Uh, and you know, although the pricing environment, you know, might might suffer as, as a result of it, like I also think you know, the Republicans are probably better situated from a geopolitical perspective to. Uh, you know, to, to wind down tension with, with China. I think Trump's more likely to make a deal with China than the Democrats, just because the Democrats really aren't having much of a dialogue, I don't think, with, uh, you know, with anyone from a foreign policy perspective. I think that changes. Uh, should that win? So, uh, man, it's honestly, it's all over the place. I think at the end of the day, you know, the next year or so is probably not going to be so great for uh, commodity stocks, but it might be six months. I mean, what, once we once we start rolling back interest rates here, you know, if that unleashes a floodgate of spending, and that you know, we could be right back to square one with regard to inflationary pressures. You know, by this time next year, so uh, it's it's a complex ecosystem. Uh, let's just say I'm I'm probably going to be more reactive to to short term prices. You know, over this next year than I have been the last two. I've been kind of agnostic to it, to tell you the truth. Um, but but now we sort of wind up in an environment where that that might matter a little bit. Um, but neither. Neither the Democrats nor the Republicans really do much to, to uh, uh, you know, in terms of changing the long-term story. That's great. Let's go to the reason you and I started talking about having you on for a, a second pod. Obviously, open invite. The people love to hear Matt talk about coal. But the reason we got excited is I started hearing people, and this really started, uh, humorously enough, there was a 13D filed on Peabody about two months ago, let's call it. And very briefly in it, it mentioned maximizing value for the PRB. And then people started kind of, and we can talk about the 13D, we can talk about people, but it just here, all of a sudden I started hearing a lot of people talk about, hey, why why isn't coal getting play for AI? And forget the, the demand pull through that we talked about. They were talking about, hey, instead of uh, shipping or coal, paying the railroads to move the coal, shipping it across seas, all this sort of stuff, why don't we build clean coal plants in Wyoming or wherever you want to choose, co-locate the AI right next to it. You've got basically unlimited fuel source, a clean fuel source. If you can do the carbon capture and everything, AI is built domestically. There's tons of space. They'll have guaranteed power. Why doesn't coal all of a sudden morph into an AI play? So I kind of laid out like that would be your utopian vision of what could happen. But I'd love to hear from you. You know, how is coal thinking about or are you hearing anything about coal like kind of playing in that utopian actually demand from AI vision? Yeah, short answer is yes. Uh, and, you know, that that sort of realization, I think, has really only happened in the last call it six months. Right. Um, you know, I heard it first at that conference that we might see another coal plant built, you know, this summer. I think that was in July uh, when I was down in Myrtle Beach. Um, and and it's, you know, as analysts, we've been talking about the possibility for years that, you know, you could see, you know, a natural gas plant paired with carbon capture or, you know, a uh, you know coal plant paired with carbon capture. So, like, the idea isn't foreign, but the fact that it's starting to become a reality is is more the... Uh, you know, wow uh, factor here. So, so there was there's one plant, uh, there's one project that this administration, the the Department of Energy, you know, Joe Biden's administration, and Kamala Harris's administration uh, gave 1.5 granted 1.5 billion dollars uh, to uh, these Wabash Valley Resources. And, and this was Monday, right? Like this yeah, is literally yeah, hot. This is Monday. Yeah. 1.5 billion to build a coal to ammonia plant with carbon capture in Indiana that's supplied by, uh, I assume the Wabash mine there, there in, in Indiana. But this is a democratic administration is giving a billion dollars to coal and carbon capture in, in order to make ammonia in a, you know, I guess a, a more green sustainable way or however you want to put it. But like well, it's happened. Just, yeah. uh, I've done some work on ammonia. So let me just say, I, I know a lot of people who ammonia, you know, that is an input, if I remember correctly, to fertilizer. And a lot of people think ammonia is a long-term solution for uh, green green marine fuel, right? Because I, I believe you can store ammonia and burn it a lot cheaper than a hydrogen or something. So I guess you're saying, hey, this is a coal to ammonia. And I think reading the press release, uh, you know, reading the Wall Street Journal, I think they were more thinking of it, hey, fertilizer is 
into national security. Ammonia's got a lot of like little call options in terms of green. So I I'm hearing you talking about it from a like coal perspective, and that is an interesting piece of it. But I wonder if that was almost just a byproduct and they were more looking at the, the ammonia perspective. Am I thinking about that incorrectly? Or how well, did you, know, look you are, but they're pairing it with carbon capture. And that's that also winds up being the get. And you know, I think it also sort of like opened the kimono with regard to, well, if you can actually sequester carbon, there's money in that. Um, you know, it's not just uh, whatever your downstream, uh, you know, product is, uh, you know, uh, your value add product, if you will. But there's also, you know, value in the 45Q, section 45Q tax credits yeah. in the IRA, which are, uh, you know, I got to read this off. It's $85 per ton of CO2 for sequestration, for pure sequestration. Uh, $60 a ton if you're going to take the CO2 and then use it for enhanced oil recovery. And then, of course, if you... If you locate this in an energy community, you get a 10% bonus on both of those. So 90, uh, 93.50 for if you sequester it uh, versus 66 if you're using it for, uh, you know, to, uh, for enhanced for EOR. So, so there's, this is kind of what's starting to come together. We've moved away from, well, let's pack the, you know, the, let's pack the, uh, the interconnection queue with all these solar and wind projects. They're never going to come on until 2035. You know, and what can we actually do? Well, we can we can try to do carbon capture. I think that's we're at that part of the cycle where people have kind of realized that's a possibility. Um, so it it does not take a leap of uh, intellectual, uh, you know, fortitude to go from carbon capture with cold ammonia and go to carbon capture with the power plant, which is uh, which is really where I think all the you know kind of long term ideas for for all this stuff started. And you know, and here we are with Peabody. Uh, with the you know the largest mine in the Powder River Basin, uh, with you know very high quality coal. If you look at how they're making money now, well, they're selling the coal for thirteen dollars a ton, and then the rails charge twenty five dollars a ton. You know to take it down to Texas or wherever the plants are, right? And then the plants, you know, basically it costs them about twenty dollars a ton to uh, you know to to burn it, and then you make probably the equivalent of another twenty dollars a ton when you pass it on to ratepayers. So ratepayers right now are paying like 80 bucks a ton or $85 a ton for $13 a ton coal uh, by the time it gets pulled all the way through to power demand. And that just seems crazy to me. So so yeah. part of part of the value proposition, I think, that, that Thomas brought up in that 13 days is eliminating the, the middlemen who are, you know, who have an interest in, uh, you know, propagating those, those sorts of transactions. So, you know, if you just take out rail or, or you know, rail gets less for a shorter move uh that's a big chunk of that uh of that proposition and then if, if power prices are 85 dollars a ton that like that, that turns into profit for whoever is has the catcher's mitt on downstream can i just push back on one point there so i certainly hear all that but the rail right like if you're taking it from wyoming to texas right like they are actually incurring costs and moving that and like yeah, yeah it, it sucks but I, I guess if i'm cutting that out like if i'm cutting that piece out <laughs> Texas has a lot more people than Wyoming, right? Like, so, A, I, I'm kind of leaving Texas shortchange. Texas is going to have to do a lot of, like, I don't believe there's any coal mined in Texas. You can tell me if I'm wrong. There might be some up in, a, a, like, a small amount in Oklahoma, if I'm remembering, but there's no coal mine there. So if I'm putting that out, A, Texas is going to have to rejigger their whole uh, their whole grid, and B, okay, I'm keeping in Wyoming. If there's the AI play, great, I can sell it to them. But you know, then they're my only buyer. I, I'm losing access to the Texas market. So I guess just on at, like how realistic is actually saying we're going to cut that rail player out because they are providing a service there. I, I just mean for the for the downstream price, right? Uh, I mean the the plant. I think that, that we'd be talking about here would be about a 300 megawatt plant. It's about a million tons of uh, of coal consumption. So it's it's not very much. You know, it's like. Million million tons of coal consumption. Call it one point three million tons, one point five million tons of of CO two. Uh, that's not really going to impact Texas. It's not really going to impact the rail at all. I, but he, okay, so what you're saying is this is just if they do this, and I'm going to ask you about the economics. Of, if they do, it's just incremental, and then yep. maybe investors are underestimating how profitable it would be because yep. you know, as you said, the coal costs twenty bucks to mine, and then twenty bucks to ship. Well, when you negotiate with the AI company, you kind of say, hey, why don't we split that? You keep $10 of the shipping, we keep $10 of the shipping. This is our most profitable thing. Th that's kind of how you're thinking about it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, the, it, it gets it gets ridiculous by the time, you know, the, the power gets passed on to ratepayers. And so the idea here would be for, you know, for the AI data centers, the closer you can locate to, 
uh, you know, an existing, you know, fuel source and, uh, you know, uh, local power grid, then the, the cheaper that you can get, uh, you know, a long-term contract power delivered to. Uh, and that's, that's what I think their get is going to be over, over a longer period of time. And that lowers the ultimate price that both ratepayers will pay, you know, for the excess power uh, and also for whatever services that AI provides, you know, lowers their cost over. So, so that's it, it's more an optimization than it is anything else, right? What would the timing? Because mm-hmm. again, I you're deeper in the industry than me. You started hearing it six months ago. I started hearing it six weeks ago. But obviously, this is new. But one thing is, it is an AI arms race, and I've seen some of these like the Bitcoin miners selling their assets to hyperscalers. And when I've talked to them, what they've said, or the Amazon Talon deal we mentioned, what they've said is, this is a race. And we understand that we are paying kind of top dollar to get these assets, but these assets are ready to power right now. And, you know, let's say we pay a billion dollars for a Bitcoin miner or, or, you know, an asset that's in the ground. If it's ready today, we're going to put $5 billion of GPUs and we're going to be sending, you know, data scientists and computer engineers who we pay $500,000 a year. So even if we're paying a premium for the data center with access to power immediately. Actually, when you NPV it, it's better than, sure, maybe we could go build that data center, but it would take three years and we've got to get internet connected. We've got to find power. So because it's so expensive on the GPU side, we need it now. I guess my question to you is, you heard about this six months ago. I heard about it six weeks ago. What would the timeline be? Because if the timeline's too long, you know, the AI companies, they they can't lose this. It has to be quick. So what would kind of the timeline be if somebody actually wanted to pull off this AI coal power play. Well, I mean, if you're going to build a new facility, period, stop. Like you're talking about a two to three year build, right? You know, for a 300 megawatt plant, it's going to take, you know, something like that. So let, let's move back from there. So two to three year build, uh, you probably, this we've never done carbon capture at scale before. So you're probably going to need, uh, you know, I think this uh, this this feed study that, uh, that BTU may participate in uh, with Pacific Corp, uh, will take about a year to do. Uh, and then after that, you'll have all it two, maybe three years of, uh, or call it two years of permitting and observation, right? So a year of the experiment, uh, of the, of the pre-feed, uh, two years permitting and observation and then a two to three year build time. So it's like 2030, uh, you know, when you're, when you're actually going to see something, right? Let me, uh, let which, me which is not, which is not tomorrow. Let's be clear. But it's not tomorrow, but you know, you would have line of sight and it'd be differentiated. And I, I could see a lot of ways to work. Let me ask you yes. different. We, I've just this, taken it on face value. Carbon capture with coal is good. And I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the science, uh, if, if I remember most of what they're talking about was for nat gas and they haven't really applied it to coal yet. Now there's no reason a nat gas coal capture shouldn't work for co- uh, nat gas carbon capture shouldn't wait work for coal, but correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe it's been applied a lot of this big carbon capture with coal. So what is the state of that technology? Like how easy it would be to deploy to every coal plant in America or any new coal plant? Like kind of how, how should people be thinking about that? Uh, it's hard to say. Well, first of all, you have to have the infrastructure to store it, or you have to be able to process the CO2 and do something with it. You know, whether that's sell to an oil company for EOR or whether that's uh, put it underground, put it, put it underground, whether it's give you know, NRP say, Hey, I know you guys have all that acreage, put it underground. Yeah. Or, you know, reprocess it and turn it into food grade CO2. Like I don't, you know, that's a, that's not necessarily my bailiwick, but why it's, why it's failed before is like, well, first of all, we haven't had the credits that were there like they are now under the IR. Yep. So that's thing one, uh, you know, number two would be logistics. Like we don't have the logistics necessary, you know, to, to, you know, in the past to, to handle uh, anything like that. Um, and, and then, you know, the third thing would be the corporate development that would need to go along with it because it's not just a utility that would want to do it uh, and do it at scale. Like you need, you need a fuel source. You need, uh, you need, you need either the rails to buy in or you need sort of alternative transportation to keep that, uh, you know, cost down to a minimum. It's just, it winds up being a lot of cats to herd and they've never had all been incentivized all at once to look at the same, uh, you know, dangly thing, right? Uh, and and that's that's where I think we we might be here at the moment. But it's you know it's not it's not a quick solution. It's not going to be a panacea for uh, for power demand. We're still going to have to build a lot of other plants as well. 
But what it can be is a model for how to do it uh, without contributing to, uh, you know, without contributing to the, to, the, to the carbon problem any worse than it already is. Uh, and if that's going to be a value that, that Western governments continue to have, like there need to be scalable solutions available to them that they can point to and say, look what we did over here in Wyoming or in Indiana or, uh, or somewhere else. You need a model by which for other people, to, other non-expert governments to, to base it on, right? I think it, I'm going to let you have the last thought on AI and then I want to move to my, but I think what's just so interesting to me is when I talked to you six months ago or three, however long ago, if we talked to coal people five years ago, people have always said coal is a dying industry. And, you know, for 20 years, American energy demand was basically flat. And then as you and I are talking today, it's growing really quickly. You know, everybody's seen the charts, Google, Wall Street Journal, PJM demand or something. It's growing. People have no clue how to keep up. And it's all from this AI stuff. And maybe AI is a bubble. Maybe it stops. It doesn't seem like it. It seems like demand is going straight up. And, you know, all of a sudden, all coal is still coal plants, everything. It's still priced at like a dying industry. And all of a sudden you could see that death is a lot longer and maybe it's a growth industry. So anything else on AI? And then I want to hit a few other interesting things that have happened. I mean, you know, once again, I think from from our sovereign perspective, it would behoove us not to win the race. And in order to do that, we're going to have to grease a lot of skids in order to, uh, you know, make sure there's enough uh, infrastructure availability for uh, for for these companies to succeed. Because it's going to be the private sector that does it, not the government themselves. They just government's got to clear the path and get out of the way and and uh, you know help help where necessary. Uh, mostly in the form of either funding or credits or incentivization or, or those types of things to keep uh, to keep the project, which is run by the private sector, on track, uh, you know, and on budget. That's really the the role there. Um, but you know, I, I think it's become clear that we we got to do it, uh, and I, I think it's I think it's become clear that we can't achieve that goal and approach the power industry the exact same way that that we've been doing it. Uh, you know, on, 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 on my side of the aisle for better or for worse for the last like 20 years. I mean, I've been, you know, waving my hands at, you know, at every, at every meeting I can in DC to try to get, to get people sort of aware of that. And of course, you know, and we talked last time when I go to nuclear events, they all know, they all know the, the nimbyism that comes with that and, and how it's, it's difficult to be a, you know, a baseload generator. The natural gas guys all know it. So there's kind of like this, uh, you know, there, there's a, there's a, a neat little, uh, consortium of of experts who you know i think are, are having some influence on on the fact that this is going to have to be an all of the above solution going forward uh and that you know i think it's becoming clear to everybody that this is a race that we ought to win just in general so it it's so the race is it but it is sad with energy policy for so many years people pointed out like hey this energy policy is silly and politicians didn't didn't take it seriously and i i think you and i come from the exact same place with it but it, it's so sad that they don't take it seriously until all of a sudden it starts hitting people's either pocketbooks with energy or pocketbooks with gas prices or energy prices. And then yeah. all the politicians get voted out and they, they realize, oh my God, if we don't address this, it's a disaster. But, you know, with just a little bit of foresight, a lot of this could have been avoided. You know, it, like we're not going to be the first people say nuclear industry over the past 30 years has been a disaster. It, it, it's just been sad that we didn't invest in. But let's go to some other stuff. Since sure, we sure. talked, we mentioned coal. We mentioned the coal for AI, which I think is super interesting. There's been two other big things, in my opinion, in the coal space that have happened. Uh, number one, I, I've, we've mentioned, but we haven't really started talking about it, the Peabody 13D. And number two, Console and Arch announced the merger just a couple of weeks ago. I, I'd love to discuss both of them because both of them are so interesting and have impacts on the space overall. Do you, do you have a preference where we start? Well, let's start with BTU because that dovetails into the previous conversation we were having about coal and AI. Um, and uh, it allows us to kind of get in, maybe get into a couple of the weeds there. Perfect. So BTU, great. Uh, beginning of August, 13D filed. Activist has bought 10% of the company. Very, very simple uh, 13D that says, hey, I want to talk to you about uh, maximizing the value. I'm doing this from memory. Maximizing the value of the PRB assets. I'd love to talk to you about that. And the other interesting thing, there were a few other things. The other interesting thing in it, he says, Peabody has, let's round it up, 1.5 billion of cash on their balance sheet. Peabody, when they talk, they kind of say we have 600 million because the difference is they've got about 900 million reserved for surety, ARO, all that type of stuff. And I thought that difference was very interesting. I, I'm, 
I think you know where I'm going with both of those. I'm very much leading the witness, but I'd love to get your overall thoughts on the Peabody activist filing. And uh, as you tell, I've been digging here. As I said, I've got a small position. I'll, I'll get real granular with you, but I'd love to get your thoughts and you can probably tell where I'm going. Well, I mean, so, you know, there were, there were basically three tiers to it. Uh, you know, the, the, fir the first one I think that we've already seen an improvement in is I thought their earnings call was great, <laughs> this last one. Uh, I thought they did a really great job of communicating, uh, you know, what the issues were in the market and, and how to, how to tee up the next, uh, you know, the next few quarters. Uh, you know, they were, they were positive on the call, kind of transparent and account, like, you know, just basic blocking and tackling, like the, the communication, you know, post 13D filing relative to the communications in, in you know, past conference calls. Um, I, I already, I already thought there was a pretty market improvement there. So like that, for me, that's, that's sort of step one. Um, I, I think, you know, now most coal companies kind of come around to the fact that their audience and their, their, you know, their, their shareholder base is a lot more diverse than it used to be. You know, it's not just institutions. It's not just people who understand the industry. Uh, you know, it's not just the I bankers, you know, now we have this like mix of retail and small family offices and generalist funds, you know, people who don't have, uh, you know, who didn't have ESG requirements and stuff like that and communicating to that, broadest set of investors is very challenging. So you have to do it pretty simply and, and you can't really get too far into your own. It, you can't talk a lot of shop. You have to kind of keep it at the top line. Uh, and and they, they did a really nice job of playing it down the middle on the last call. So that's step one. Um, number two would be the sell down of Centurion to some degree, right? So so they have, uh, you know, Peabody took a stance and said, well, we think we think Centurion's NPV is about $1.6 billion. You know, that's at like a, a $210 coal price or something. So, so it's pretty conservative. Uh, when, when I run it, you know, at 215 220 I get about $1.5, $1.6 billion too. So I'm right in the same ballpark when, when I take my assumptions and, and plug it in there. I think that's a pretty fair estimate. Um, you know, what we saw with, you know, with uh, Whitehaven, was that when you get a valuation that is reflective of, you know, what we think, you know, medical prices are going to average over a longer period of time, you know, not just here over the next year or two where, you know, maybe over the next few months we struggle to average 200, uh, you know, but, you know, in two years we're back to, you know, averaging 250 or so. You know, if you value this at 250 and you get, you get a partner that comes in that says, okay, well, I want to be sure that I have the supply and I will, I'm willing to, you know, to buy in at a 20% premium, you know, I think that's a deal that you take, right? That's, that's, that's what motivated the closure of, uh, you know, of the Whitehaven uh, deal with Japan. Uh, and I think if, if uh, you know, somebody came in to, uh, you know, to, to offer that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of outcome here, uh, they'd have to really consider it. Um, and, you know, that adds cash to the balance sheet that they can, buy back shares with or, you know, hold in reserve to ensure that Centurion gets repleted. And there's all kinds of stuff that you can do. So, so I think, I think that's the number, that's the, that was the other big get, I think that, the, uh, you know, was there a third point you wanted or should I lob some questions at you? Uh, you can't, I mean, the third one was, you know, maximizing the value of the PRB asset, be that through, uh, you know, an AI data center, for instance, uh, you know, partnering with, you know, probably it's going to be, you know, meta, Microsoft or Amazon. I mean, Meta's already in Wyoming uh, doing work there. I think that's, is that Black Hills? I think that they're working with there. I can't remember. Um, but uh, so, so with one of those companies to bring it into some sort of locale, Wyoming's all for it. Uh, everybody in Wyoming wants that to happen. I mean, really the only issue right now is, you know, I, I do think that the, that the top level companies are, are looking a little bit more at population centers and latency uh, rather than, you know, trying to minimize power costs. But, uh, you know, that would be, you know, let's call it, uh, I think, uh, power prices, call it high 40s per megawatt hour. Uh, and for on-peak and high 30s probably for off-peak, the cost of that business per megawatt hour is probably about 25 bucks. So... You know, you're producing, let's say, about 1.6 million tons of CO2 at 93.50. You, you wind up, you wind up with a, you know, about if there's no credits available, it's probably like a 70 
million per year EBITDA business, 75, 80, somewhere like that. And then if, if there are credits available and you maximize the value of them, you're talking about like a 200 million EBITDA business uh, with the credit. So like if you go down that road, uh, that's that's every year. That's annual. Uh, and, and this is a this is a three billion market cap company. So l- let yeah. me jump in there with a, a few different questions. We can go over. Let, let's go. Let's go in reverse to everything you just. Uh, let's go in chronological order to everything you just talked about. And let's talk about the way they communicated on the earnings call first. Mm-hmm. And there was something interesting they did. And, and I'll, I'll mention this with C, uh, the CIX Arch merger as well. CIX Arch merger. They came out and announced their merger. And on the merger call. More than half the questions and more than half of it was devoted to CIX and Arch talking about an analyst asking, how are you going to return capital? And they're basically just saying, we're going to buy back shares. And the Peabody uh, Q2 call, they, they talk about, hey, we increased our share buyback by about $100 million. We're going to return capital. And they also came out and had this really weird thing, I thought, where they said, uh, let me make sure I've got it. They said, Our stock recently crossed the 50-day moving average and the 100-day moving average as coal equities have traded off with coal prices. So we see this as a really attractive point in time. And I I listen to hundreds of earnings calls a year. I don't think I've ever heard a management team on a call talk about 50-day and 100-day moving averages on their stock. And I don't want to get too belabored on that point. But what I'm asking is, I'm just interested that you've got... CIX Arch merger, biggest merger in coal in years. You've got Peabody and their news call. They're almost talking like bad pod shop analysts versus coal uh, versus coal management teams. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on on that overall frame point as how they're communicating, why you think they're doing that, how you look at that. Uh, I mean, I think that was an effort to uh, you know sort of uh, appeal to the Magic Lions crowd. Uh, I- you know, it's it's an acknowledgement that they have uh, folks who are uh, looking at those sorts of things and sort of a signal that they're aware of it. I think more so than anything else. Uh, you know, I certainly would never uh, you know apply a value to a company based on fifty day moving average or whatever. Uh, you know, I, I think Peabody's undervalued because I don't think uh, you know I, I I don't think the market's giving credit for higher met coal prices in the future at the moment. I don't think the market's giving credit for, you know, Centurion's uh, free cash flow generation at those higher prices, certainly. Um, and I don't think the market's really given credit for, you know, the possibility that they they might be able to sell down a little bit of the operation at a premium, which would be, that would be a good outcome. I mean, I think that's the only deal that you accept, right? Uh, and and I don't think the, the market's given them credit for the fact that, you know, a plant in the PRB is, is a not just a distinct possibility, but I think it's better than a coin flip to be reality by the end of the decade. Uh, so, you know, if I, if I were talking, that's probably what, what I would allude to, uh, you know, less so than the 50 day movie. <laughs> yeah. No, look, it just, it jumped. It, I read the CIX call first and I was like, Oh, this is really interesting. People don't really care about the merger. They care about the capital return. And then I read the Peabody thing. And I was like, Oh my God, I've never, so it was a good question and it's a fun way to frame it, but I, I completely hear you. It's just, a, yeah, it's, let's I mean, to the next, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, they, they, well, I mean, they did say like, look, we got, we got a hundred million dollars for buybacks. And <laughs> by the way, we're below the, the 50 and a hundred day moving average, which, uh, you know, to be fair, uh, I, when, usually when that happens, is not such a great sign. <laughs> when it moves below those averages. But, uh, you know, I, again, I think, what, what are we valued at? Like $2 billion here at this point in time? 2.2 something? It's just, I, I've got it with the converts. I've got it at 3.2 at Peabody. Oh, 3.2. But it, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's still too cheap relative to its peers, let's just say. Uh, and and th- that that in and of itself, I think, will be it'll be easier to resolve on the upside. And of course, they have a buyback, which I think will put a bid under the stock as as time keeps going on. Uh, but you know, all of us still need coal prices to go up for you know to to really make a mint too. So let me t- let me turn to a qu- a classic yet another value podcast question. Uh, just sticking with capital allocation, right? All of these coal companies have gotten the memo. You are capital return stories, at least in my opinion, they've gotten them. You know, some people debate. You know, Peabody, they've got this Centurion investment. Uh, Warrior, they're they're still finish up uh, Blue Blue Creek or Blue Coal. I can't remember, but it, they all know the end game is you just return the capital to shareholders. Maybe you do the console arch merger, get some synergies along the way, but you do the capital returns. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, I, I think they, you know, they hear from us. They say you're underpriced. They say we agree. We're buying back shares. We're trading below the 50-day moving average. I guess my question is, why is there no insider ownership? You know, insider ownership sucks across the board at all of these coal companies, well, except for maybe AMR. Why, why aren't we seeing insiders step up and say, "Hey, Peabody, our stock is cheap. Let's buy some." Let, we believe. I, I want to turn to Centurion in a second, but if you believe Centurion is 1.5 billion in NPV and our market cap is three billion, well, gosh darn it, we're really effing undervalued. Let's buy some shares. Let's get some exposure to the stock. Well, I mean, you know, first of all, most of these companies are mature. I mean, you know, Consol's been around since the 1800s. Peabody's been around since the 1800s. Uh, Arch was formed, uh, uh, you know, in the uh, you know mid 1900s. Uh, you know, actually, uh, uh, Randy Atkins, who's CEO of Ramco, his dad was one of the people who founded Arch. Like, you know, at this point in time, you know, Al Alpha has been around for 25 years in some form. And, you know, it, it merged with Massey 10 years ago and Massey had been around since, uh, you know, 18. So these are, these are very old, very mature companies. Uh, and you know, the founders are long dead. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I hear you, but I just, you know, they all trade really cheaply. They buy back shares. If you're a management team and you believe it or you're Peabody and you say, Oh, we'll talk PRB in a second. You believe Centurion, you believe that you might get a data. I'd love to see them just write a fifty thousand dollar check and buy stock on the open market. You know, well, and that's what I think you're going to see uh, here at some point in time. And when you start it in a, in a in an industry that is primarily run by managers rather than founders, right? Uh, you know, the shares are part of their compensation structure. So insider sales don't aren't really that telling. That's how that's part of how people get paid. Insider purchases, on the other hand, uh, tell a very different story. Uh, and, you know, we certainly, I, you know, we're going to see that when, you know, coal prices are going to the moon and so are stock prices, right? But when now we're on the other side of that cycle and some of these people have done really well over the past two or three years. Uh, and I would, I would go ahead, go out on a limb and say that when, 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 when things you think are starting to get, you know, maybe pretty bad or maybe the outlook doesn't look so great, but you start to see insiders buying. I think that'll be a bigger vote of confidence this time around, especially uh, than it than it meant last time. Nobody had paid any attention last time when uh, you know when you saw Mike Gorzinski you know come into the market and buy you know umpteen jillion alpha shares at you know at two hundred dollars, uh, you know. So you know, but now you know if you see you know Andy Esser, you see Jim Gretsch or Mark Spurback or somebody come into the market, uh, you know, and buy shares this time around, that means more. Uh, means more than it did in the, in the previous cycle. So, you know, with regard to that, I'm, I'm not so concerned about the overall participation, uh, but I do think that when that, when you see that participation inflect uh, beyond compensation, that that's something to pay attention to. I'm, I'm ready for it. I'm here. I, I'm ready to strap onto the rocket and ride it to the moon. Let me ask okay. one more question that I think I'm a generalist. Uh, any generalist who looks at the space, is going to be one of the first questions they have. Elliot, it, BTU was a big overhang for several years, and they basically blew out of their stake last year. And we're not speaking to Elliott specifically, but, it, you know, I think people look at this and say a very sharp hedge fund with uh, that that wrote it basically. If I remember correctly, Elliott made the investment in like the late 2017s in the mid 20s. They ride it all the way down through COVID. Everything's dying to you know, they buy in the mid 20s and they see it hit maybe the mid 20 cents per share. And then they write it back up to the mid 20s and they sell in 20 30. And I think people might say that was before the AI boom happened and everything. But they say, hey, you've got this really sharp company that owned a lot. And they they basically blew out of the stock pretty aggressively. Like, why wouldn't they have stuck around for another two years when the valuations were cheap, the cash flow was starting, you know, and we don't have to speak to their thing specifically. But I think people look across the sector and kind of look at that. Well, I mean, duration was was part of that, right? You know, they invested in 2017, it's 2024, and uh, they were done with it. You know, they, they'd been through that cycle, uh, and that was as good as they were going to do. And uh, I suspect they didn't want to go through another cycle. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, Thomas, this time around, obviously the story is a lot different. Uh, and they have, a, they have a very different understanding fundamentally of, uh, you know, of men in thermal coal markets. Um, so, so I think, I think the personnel is different and it makes kind of a difference. Uh, you know, it, di different people are differently sharp. I'll just say that. I, I think ask an answer. And I think that's a great answer. This episode is brought to you by Tegas, the future of investment research. 
Look, if you've been reading my newsletters, you know how often I rely on Tegas for my research. I probably read one or two expert calls a day, You know, probably average seven a week off of Tegas. Uh, they've got the largest transcript library in the world with over 75% of the private market transcripts. Whether you're curious about AI, biotech, or any niche market, Tegas has the insights you need. What sets Tegas apart is its all-in-one pack platform. It's packed with expert call transcripts, management checks, panel calls, and in-depth financial data. No more jumping between different services or piecing together fragmented data. With Tegas, everything is right at your fingertips. The best part? The insights you get are from the very people shaping the industries you're interested in. You'll find perspective from insiders and executives that you can't get anywhere else. To see Tegas in action and understand why it's one of my go-to resources, visit tegas.com slash value. That's T-E-G-U-S dot com slash value. Trust me, once you try Tegas, you'll never look back. Two juiciest questions I have for today. Let's start with, I want to go to the PRB, right? Sure. Uh, we've mentioned how the PRB could be a real asset if they you know, build an AI data center and start funding the building shows. But I think there are other levers they could pull. And I kind of started hinting at it when I said, hey, Peabody says they've got 500 million of cash on the balance sheet. The 13D says they've got 1.5 billion. There's a big difference in its sureties. I'd love to talk about the, the other levers that could pull, be pulled to unlock value in PRB. Yeah, it's uh, it's hard to say. The shorty, the shorties are an issue, and you would think they could be renegotiated. But um, from what I understand from talking to another people, it's it's really hard to to negotiate those down. You know, the best the best thing that you can do is mine out what you're supposed to mine out because you reclaim as you go. You can't reclaim all at once. If they stop mining, you know, they'd be losing money for a few years while they you know while they filled in what they had. So like they wouldn't, you know, that money wouldn't come back, you know. You're closer to the space than I am. But if I remember correctly, Arch or Alpha kind of shut down a project because the surety and everything was getting overlapped. What about regulators granting surety, ARO, whatever relief to kind of support the industry, keep these jobs going, maybe encourage? Is there anything along there or am I just kind of seeing magic Uh, mushrooms? I, I can't see the government. Uh, you know, pulling back the requirement to, you know, to backfill, you know, to reclaim land back to approximate original contour. Okay. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't seem like something that's, that's in the cards. Um, you know, honestly, the, the easy, I, I really think the easiest way for them to get that money back onto the, onto the right side of their, uh, of the, uh, of their, of their cash balance is to just, Mine it out is to keep going. And one of the ways that they can keep going is to find these downstream projects uh, and even kind of create them. That'll create 20, 20 years, 30 years of demand so that you, over time, you you monetize that, that all that shorty money right back onto your, right back onto your cash balance. So I might've been just making, I might've been a little too aggressive. Again, it's a very short 13D that says maximize PRB value. I might've been a little too aggressive thinking about the the cash differences and maybe realizing value there. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where you have to have them or you can't operate. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. If, you, if you were to, you know, just say, okay, well, we're done, shut it down. Let's reclaim what we have and take the rest back to whatever. Well, I mean, you're still going to lose money while you reclaim and you're not producing over those few years. And so there's an optimization that you have to do. Well, how much money are we going to lose while we, you know, fill in this this giant pit, you know, with 40 foot seams, mind you, it's not a small, one. Uh, you know, how much is that going to cost us to, uh, you know, to get back to here? And, you know, what does that do to our cash balance in the, in the, in the process? And I, th- I think, uh, you know, the, the, the broad conclusion, and I haven't gone down into the shorty weeds by any stretch of the imagination. I've had, uh, you know, slightly below surface conversations with some people who know, uh, and the pretty much the universal answer has thus far, at least spoken to me has been just mind the coal, (laughs) just mind the coal, get it done. Uh, and then come out, come out the other side of it. That's, that's the best, uh, the best outcome. And, and with, you know, now that we're not retiring coal plants quite as aggressively, specifically in the PRB, if they're going to get a new lease on life, um, I'm not sure that's necessarily as big of an issue over the longer term. They haven't fully funded, which is great. They don't have to put any more dollars toward it. In fact, they're going to get some back gradually as they go. Um, you know, I'd love to see more come out of that that they could buy back shares with. And if there's a process whereby that could happen, I would 100% support it. I don't know what that process is, though. 
Let's quickly hit Centurion and then we're running long. We can wrap up or we can we can riff on Cole forever if you want. Just Centurion, I want to ask you two questions. One friend framed it to me like this, and I really like the framing. Hey, 18 months ago, if you were looking at HCC, met, uh, where it met, uh, this Blue Creek co- project, it was clear there was value, but because it's a coal company and no one was looking at it, nobody gave value. And then as it got closer and closer to startup, people started to give it value. And that's basically been the best performing Met stock over the past 18 months because, you know, it's gone from basically 25 to 50. And as prices have come down, everything else is kind of flat. And that's because people gave that value. And the way the friend framed it to me was, hey, with Centurion, that's where you are with BTU right now. You know, they... They just in June, I believe they had first coal come. They're really going to start ramping over the next two years. I think 2026 when it's fully online. He was basically like, look, when you roll the calendar to 25, it's going to be beating people over the face how much cash flow this thing's about to throw off. And whether they sell a stake or not, that's where you are. Do you, how do you feel about that framing? Do you like kind of like that story? Would you push back anywhere? Yeah, that's pretty good. I mean, it, you know, 250 bucks, they're going to make about $300 million in free cash flow, like not, you know, EBITDA, not anything like free cash flow at uh, at those elevated met coal price levels. So, so yeah, I, I think that's right. I, you know, will 25 be incredibly successful, you know, from a met coal price perspective? It's looking like probably not, uh, you know, with China where it's at. Ne- never say never. I mean, we're headed into winter. Uh, La Nina is down in Australia. But we have one singular weather event that takes out supply. Or we have, uh, you know, some kind of an outage at a mine down there. Like there's, you, there are no upside surprises basically on the supply side. So, uh, you know, any any supply that comes out can see prices go right back, you know, basically to where they were. But absent any of that happening right now, you know, I think it's going to be about six to twelve months before we see pretty material improvement, uh, you know, from from the China steel debacle. Uh, and that has to get resolved before before Met can can start sailing again. Now there's there's also I should point out iron ore. Iron ore has been declining as well as stockpiles uh, you know kind of build up on the on the Chinese coast uh, for that commodity as well. The more the more that iron ore comes down, the more space that carves out for coking coal in the total uh, you know cost buildup of a steel plant. So so I think there you know that these prices here you know around 180 are pretty pretty supportive. Call it like 180 down to like one, you start getting down into like 175, 170, 160, you're going to start to see closures. Yeah. Uh, yep. But, but, but here at like 180, you know, everybody can make a little bit of money. Uh, and then I started to mention earlier, trade flows also adjust, right? So if you're the US right now, the, the arbitrage window into Asia is closed. It's done. You can't match a PLV plus shipping into India right now to save your life. But also the, uh, Australia is shut out of Europe. They're shut out of Brazil. So they're, you know, they're still going to deliver contracts, but they're not going to make that much, you know, that much money off of them. Uh, and w- when the price gets this, this low, the other thing that happens on the Met side is trade goes back to their natural places. The U.S. supplies Europe and Brazil, and that's it. Uh, you know, Australia supplies Asia, and, and that's it. And then the two basins don't really mix around too much. So we haven't, we haven't seen that adjust yet because we're still in the middle of a year. People still have committed tons that they have to deliver. That's got to work itself out before, you know, China works itself out before we start to see uh, some some relatively more predictable uh, outcomes in the Met coal market. I hope that makes sense. No, nope, makes total sense. Last question on Centurion, and then I'll let you wrap it up and we'll, we'll go. You know, there's two things that could happen here. They could develop this. I mean, look, the big risk is always meteor strikes, whatever, but they could develop it. And in about 18 months, they've got one of the lowest cost met coal producers in the world. And it's just starts gushing cash. And we love that. The other route they could go is, as you mentioned earlier, they could sell a stake in it. It could be, it could become a JV. They could sell 25% as a strategic partner, whatever. They could take that cash in and then hopefully buy back shares, do some capital allocation, right? And I'm of two minds, right? Of one mind, Everything's opportunity costs. Selling a crown jewel for a big multiple and buying back your stock at three times EBITDA sounds really nice. On the other hand, historically, when you have a crown jewel and you start selling pieces of it, you know, generally when you're you're kind of selling the crown jewels to support everything else, it's not great. So I could be of two minds of it. I'd love to just ask if if I gave you right now the world as we know it, what do you think would make the most sense? What would make you the, the happiest as somebody who follows BTO? I mean, if it's me, I I mean I I'd rather just keep the buying and, and you know cash flow the operation and buy back shares that way because um, I don't think they necessarily need a partner to to make full value. But 
you know, again, if somebody comes in and pays you, you know, a 250 average for 25% of the operation, all you're doing is pulling forward that cash flow to right now. Yep. So it's it's kind of six and a half dozen on the other. And then if you I, if you if you one of those one of those you know the person who's buying it happens to be a you know big steel producer or somebody who has a vested interest in the offtake, like you it's a good business relationship to have too that can that can increase over time. So it's it, it all depends on the circumstances, uh, but just if you in a vacuum, eh, I'd rather just keep the mind mind the coin. I'm with you. I, I just keep thinking like you sell it for twenty five, sell a twenty five percent stake. You get hundreds of millions of dollars in, and then you buy your shares back now. Like I, I used the Warrior Creek, uh, the Warrior Met comparison earlier. You know, if they had bought back twenty percent of their stock at twenty five before it went on that run, like the run would have been even more epic, right? Mm-hmm. And maybe BTU has that chance, but you know, they announced they sell a twenty five percent stake, and the stock would probably be up. So I, I, I was just kind of doing all that math, uh, and with an activist, that is something. That is, Matt, the company needs to be doing. So it's something we could look at. Matt, this has been awesome. We've gone way over an hour. We've hit on so much. Uh, I didn't get a ton from C- CIX Arch. Maybe we'll say, save that for another day. But just want to wrap it up. Anything in the coal markets you think we we should have hit harder that you uh, we kind of missed or anything? Or can we wrap it up here? I mean, I can make a quick comment on CIX and Arch. I mean, really, the get there is you consolidate all the big long wall production in West Virginia under Consol's expertise and operating culture. Like they're the best long wall operators in the business. Jimmy Brock was one of the greatest long wall operators ever. Uh, he, he knows he knows how to how those assets should be run. I think that's that's a win there. Uh, they also they also get some synergies from from owning the port uh, in yep. Baltimore. So so Lear and Lear South, you know, I think we'll probably have some flexibility with the rails as well uh, that that Consol enjoys. Um, and uh, and then also the Arch Beckley mine down south in Central Appalachia. Uh, is not terribly far from Consol's Ipman mine as well. And uh, Beckley has access to CSX, which has access to Arches Port, uh, you know, in Newport News. So now we can take Ipman coal, you know, truck it up to CSX if we want and go out through captive, uh, uh, you know, a, a captive port in, you know, that, that Arch owns. So, like, those are the synergies that that I sort of understand and get really well. I think we're going to make a world of difference for for both companies. I'm, I'm still, you know, the Western assets are a bit of a question mark for me, but, uh, you know, West Elk can make some money. Uh, and, you know, we talked about the prospect of, of, of you know, the PRB as a call option on uh, AI data center availability. So who knows? Um, but, uh, you know, that's that's been the other big thing that went down. I think you know, probably worth taking a couple of time, a couple of minutes to, to chat about. But, uh, you know, really, other than that, uh, I think uh, we're at the point in the time of the cycle where just you know, take a deep breath, hunker down. Uh, You know, it's going to be a long few months for Met. Uh, We're heading into thermal cold shoulder season, but now's the time when you start making a list and going, you know, which, which companies do I think, uh, you know, are the best targets. And then when prices start moving in the right direction, that's when you connect. Matt, I should have mentioned at the start, since our last podcast, you know, our last podcast, you came on and you're like, Hey, I'm glad we're doing it now. I might be, you know, getting locked up. So I won't be not locked up for jail, locked up in terms of, I won't be able to be as public. (laughs) So I, you know, I'm glad we're doing it now. And and since then, actually, happy you you took over the coal trader, which I'm a subscriber to, a happy subscriber to. So you can continue to be public. And you know, I yeah. love following it. I read just about everything you put it. And sometimes you say stuff where you're like, you know, the coal is going down this route and should be going down this route. And I have to nod my head, like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. I'm not really sure what's going on, but it's great to follow as a generalist because I get really deep insight. So I'll include a link in the show notes. Happy sub if anybody wants to check it out. But Matt, this has been an awesome run through. We'll have to do a follow-up maybe as the year turns or something, just see how everything's going because a lot's going on in the coal space. We'll have the election, fortunately, will be behind us one way or the other. Uh, we might get some more movement on Peabody. Well, it's just, uh, it's a really fascinating time. But Matt, really appreciate you coming on. Link My to the pleasure. coal trader in the show notes and looking forward to the third time. Sounds great, Andrew. Thanks a lot. A quick disclaimer, nothing on this podcast should be considered investment advice. Guests or the hosts may have positions in any of the stocks mentioned during this podcast. Please do your own work and consult a financial advisor. Thanks.